Welcome to Fading Memories, a supportive podcast for those of us caring for a loved one with memory loss. With me today on the podcast, we're doing something a little special. We're co-hosting. Ryan McEnough is with me. He has the Caregiver Toolkit podcast, and he's also a private home care business. So thanks for joining me, Ryan. Yep, no problem. Just a correction, it's the Caregiver's Toolbox. Toolbox. That's toolbox. That's the, 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 the podcast. Name. You know, I can either get a name. I always get something wrong with names. My brain and names do not, do not work well together. <laughs> if that's the worst thing that happens to me today, I'm doing pretty good. Oh, that's a good thing. So we're going to discuss whether or not we want to leave our loved ones in a nursing home, maybe touch on, on what to do when we have a situation like a big flu outbreak in a memory care, assisted living, nursing home, community kind of deal. Since we're, a lot of people are dealing with, you know, my, I can't go see my loved one in the memory care or the nursing home because COVID's got everything shut down. You know, a lot of people understandably are not happy about that. And some people are like, I'm going to yank my family member out. And I think that that's a decision that needs a lot more thought process. So I think that's what we're talking about today. <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, I, I do private home care services. So I should say up front, you know, there might be some bias here in what you should be doing. But, but all joking aside, I, I, I don't know, you know, what I've been seeing in the last six to eight weeks is everybody that's in senior care is hurting on some level. Some are worse than others. My business is down. Assisted livings aren't taking people in. Nursing homes are taking very few people in. Some Everybody's a little bit different. So, um, you know, while it might benefit me in some aspects for people to leave nursing homes or assisted livings, um, yeah, I don't think it's going to be an overwhelming uh overwhelming success because a lot of people in my, I imagine a lot of people who have either lost their jobs or been furloughed or have seen their hours reduced, well, then they can uh, spend more time with their loved ones being a family caregiver. So there's certainly two sides to that coin. Well, that kind of brings up my, my reasoning for thinking that it should be a, a very well thought out decision. And it's obviously one that would have been nice if we'd all thought about, you know, before 2020 happened, <laughs> but of course, that's not how we, we usually do things. My mom was in a memory care, and she was there predominantly because my dad died. I had just turned 50. My sister is four and a half years younger. She has school-age kids. We all still work, and I honestly didn't feel that mom would get the stimulation that she needed if she was at my house, if she was at my house, she would have needed, she would have needed somebody to come in and help us take care of her. And I just, I just didn't see it as being the best situation overall for all of us. And, and it was kind of sprung on me. I was told, oh, well, you know, your dad thinks your mom's going to come live with you. I was like, <laughs> no conversation on that one. Okay, great. A couple of years ago, her, the community she lived in, the assisted living um, side had a huge flu outbreak. I mean, huge. They had to shut down the dining room, deliver meals to the residents in their apartments, which affected the memory care. This time around, it's worse because now there's not visitors coming in. While my mom was on hospice, there was the hospice people were stretched thin and they were not there as often as they originally had told me that they would be, which, you know, I, that, that's not a complaint. It's just the fact of life. And one of the things when we cleaned out mom's room, one of the things the staff was telling me is that because the residents aren't going out with family members, family members are not coming in. It's harder for them to keep them engaged in participating in activities. So even though they're in the community, they've got all the services there. It's still not ideal. And it's just, I thought that was very interesting. So, you know, you get a lot of pros and cons on both sides. And I've actually been thinking about this situation because a lot of people are like, I don't know, should I take my mom out of the memory care? And a nursing home is even a bigger deal because that's, 
you know, that's medical care. So I don't know. What are you, what are your thoughts on this? I think, um, I think, the, you know, the, the, there's no magic bullet and there's no right answer and it all depends. Um, you know, in, I'm in Massachusetts. I'm in the greater Boston area. We're in a hot spot right now. Um, a report just came out in the Boston Globe yesterday that says one in five, 20% of nursing homes in Boston or in Massachusetts, excuse me, has had over 20 COVID related deaths. Um, oh there are dozens of nursing homes that have over 30 and 40 deaths that have occurred in them and they've run the gamut from large corporations that own hundreds of nursing homes to family mom and pop to government uh, uh owned, for lack of a better word, government-funded nursing homes. So there doesn't seem to be much of a rhyme or a reason for this. So in Boston, you're probably going to get, if, if your loved one's in Boston and you can take somebody, your parent, back into the home for, for a period of time without there being medical consequences to that, I guess my answer would be yes. If you're in another part of the country, whether it's you know, Montana or down in Florida, they seem to be having a better, a better go at this, Texas or wherever it is, and you're having less of a, uh, uh, an issue with nursing homes, then my answer would probably be no. Um, you know, the big question is, is, is you, you've mentioned nursing homes and then there's memory care and there's assisted livings. Well, like you said, you know, if somebody's in a, uh, a nursing home, are, there, either are they there for a medical reason or are they there for dementia? Or is it, is, it, is it something in between? Is it even possible to bring mom or dad home? That's the first big question. And then if it's possible, the second question is, should you do it? And I think that term is really determined on the, the set of circumstances of where you're located and if you can handle that. Or do you have a good enough relationship with mom or dad to be with them 24 hours a day? Or is the, de is the dementia that they have a little bit more, uh, is, that, is that combative? Is it something that you can even deal with? Is it something where you're gonna end up needing to bring private home care caregivers into the home where you're basically in the same situation as you were maybe in a nursing home, but it's a little bit safer. So there's a lot of moving parts on answering that question. But from what I'm seeing with nursing homes in the Boston area, yeah, my answer would be yes. Maybe in your part of the, the neck of the woods out in California, that the answer would be no. Well, I don't know about nursing homes. I'm in the San Francisco Bay Area, way out in the far-flung part of the suburbs, you know, basically out here in the, in the, <laughs> the very tail end of the Bay Area. And I'm going to give a shout out to MBK Senior Living because they are the corporation that runs the community my mom lived in, and they have had no, no outbreak, no deaths. I don't, well, I know how they did it. They kicked us all out. <laughs> which was a little bit of a challenge in the beginning, but I understood their reasoning. But when we cleaned out mom's room, they said, yep, nobody's gotten it. There was one employee they thought had tested positive, but that was a false positive. So, you know, they tested positive. They were, you know, basically kicked off the property until they self-quarantined, came back with a negative test result. So that was all really good. But that's really, you know, like I said earlier, it's been a real challenge for them. They're not letting people in. They're not moving people in. Uh, my mom died May, March 31st, and we cleaned out her room like two weeks ago, so middle of May, which I was surprised because they still don't want people coming in. Um, you know, it's just, they did a great job, but I'm sure that they're very stressed. So I don't, I don't know. My mom was combative, and until she broke her leg, she still walked and talked like somebody in the later middle stage of Alzheimer's. But once she broke her leg, then she was bed bound and she refused physical therapy. So she needed somebody that could be there all the time. I mean, and it just, the end came because she didn't want them to feed her and she didn't want help. And oh, it was just, it wasn't good. So I never considered moving her out. I also didn't think she was going to leave us. I thought she'd recover. So there was a lot of stuff going on the beginning of March, the middle of March, that removing her from the, where she lived was never, ever a consideration because I can only imagine the confusion. Well, that's a huge thing is upending their entire, you know, living situation to me is, that's something you have to really consider because it's extremely stressful. And if you've got a broken brain, 
I can only imagine. We moved at the beginning of this year, so I'm fairly familiar with the stress of moving. <laughs> and certainly with somebody with dementia, you know, they, every, every uh, diagnosis is a little bit different and unique to an individual, but in general, you, changing uh, your surroundings is can be very traumatic and it can take weeks for somebody to get into their their back to their normal self or um, adjust to that so it can certainly be stressful and I certain and I know you know when this was all starting to happen the people I spoke to you know whether it was financial advisors whether it was friends whether it was family whether it was other people in the senior care community uh, we were all maybe naively hoping that this was going to be a two week to a four week thing, right? Like, Oh, this is going to blow over, you know, like it's going to be bad for, I think as a country, we were kind of all like a lot of us were all kind of like hoping that this thing was just going to kind of be like that scare with a bullet, right? We're like mm -hmm. five people got it. And then it just kind of went away. You know, it just, just the news never reported on it. You know, when, when I remember when I was like, Oh my God, a bowl is going to be everywhere. And we're all going to die. Um, and this ended up being the one, right? This was the one that, that, that became a disaster. And, you know, we're at this point in time where we're still trying to figure out how widespread it is. We're still trying to figure out what the actual death rate of this thing is. We thought it was going to be 5%. Now it might be a half a percent. Um, it could be somewhere in between, you know, you, it all depends on what data you look at. And so, you know, my, the reason I bring this up and, it, and it's, it's a valid point of what you, you said is that there were probably a lot of people that were sitting there going like, why are we going to need to bring mom or dad home? It's only going to be for two or three weeks. And now two or three weeks is, is turned into 24 months possibly, uh. you know? <laughs> and, and so the other thing that a lot of people are going to start thinking about very quickly is senior loneliness and isolation and being alone in a room um, completely by yourself, basically 24 hours a day, except when people come in to bring you your meals or maybe to do some, some uh, light personal care. And then the rest of the time, you know, you're expected to be self-sufficient in your own room if you're in, a, in an assisted living or if you're in a nursing home, it might be you two people to a room, but you don't get to choose your, your, your roommate. And so, you know, I've done podcasts on how detrimental that um, being completely alone is. Um, we're already seeing it in younger, the younger population, and by younger, I mean people that aren't in nursing homes, you know, that people are isolating and people are going a little crazy and they're going stir crazy and they're getting cabin fever. And so what's that going to look like to, uh, you know, to, to seniors who, you know, for them, one day feels like a week and one week feels like a month and one month feels like six months, you know, and they haven't seen loved ones and they're not lucky enough to be on the first the first uh, story or the ground floor where they can see their loved ones through a window. Maybe they're on the third or fourth floor and then all of a sudden they're really alone and they, they can't see out the window. And I think that's going to be a, another consideration. Obviously it's better to be lonely than to be dead, but you know, being lonely can have its own negative consequences that can lead to death. And it can lead to that, that mental fatigue where people want to give up, they start to decline quicker, and they could go on to hospice and inevitably pass away because of that isolation. So there are a lot of moving parts that we didn't really expect to, to see with all of this that, uh, you know, that is important to think about. Like, if your loved one is a very social butterfly, maybe bringing them home is really important to make sure that they get that social interaction with people that they 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 uh they know hopefully yeah when we cleaned out mom's room we were in the memory care and we also were over in the assisted living where the offices are and they were still doing they were playing some of the ladies were playing bingo this was on the assisted living side and it was a little bit sad because they were all at separate little small tables so they were at least participating in activity and they were sort of together it was definitely better than being isolated in their apartments and I'm trying to think I don't know I don't know of any assisted living communities in my general area that are more than three stories all the ones in my town are two mom's was two memory care is one was the ground floor but obviously in other cities there's taller ones but all out here they're only one or two or three stories max and there's issues with window visits, not for 
seniors living in assisted living, but seniors in memory care might not understand why you can't come in or they can't go out and you might trigger the desire for them to leave or what is it, elopement syndrome, which is a really strange term, but that's better than trying to escape is not a very nice term. <laughs> That's exactly why that word was that. That is the equivalent of a, a, a waste management uh, manager versus, you know, a janitor or something like that. It's, it's a nice way to say that somebody escaped and is on the run and, and uh, we don't know where they are. <laughs> yeah. Well, you wouldn't want to go and visit your mom through a window and then have her give the staff a hard time because she wants you to come in or she wants to go out. Or I could just see a lot of problems with that predominantly with memory care. The memory care, obviously, they weren't confined to their rooms because I'm not even sure that would be doable without locking the doors, which that doesn't sound at all pleasant for anybody. So I'm glad they didn't do that. But I think that's why they basically said it was like March 16th. They were like, nope, nobody's coming in, which was abrupt. I mean, we went from just going in and out. I mean, we were supposed to sign in, but I don't know that anybody ever did. And then we had to go through the front, the main entrance, and have temperature check and sign in, and it was all very formal. We, I did that a couple times at, right after she came out of the hospital, and then it was, it was, I mean, they had sawhorses and caution tape in front of the door. It was like, you are not coming to this door. <laughs> go away. It was, it was very clear that their intention was they didn't want people there. And like I said a minute ago, they did a great job because they've had no issues, and there's... It's probably at least 300 residents. There's probably more, but I know I know the memory care is not full. So the other flip side of this coin, I know people caring for their spouse or their parent at home are having a hell of a time because the adult social programs are shut down and having in you know their their regular in-home caregivers has been hit and miss one friend of mine their va caregiver the caregiver's sister got sick so the caregiver had to self-quarantine for two weeks which meant my friend and her dad did not have that caregiver for two weeks and it it just like every routine that they had in place just was imploded she went from having help seven days a week to having help she was lucky if she got seven hours a week and she feels he's declining more quickly, which I've heard a lot of. And, you know, she's at the end of her rope. So it's like, I'm not sure there is an answer to this question, but my thought was if you know that you're going to have to take care of your loved one at home, or you're going to put them in an assisted living memory care community, there's a lot of things you should think about that we probably weren't aware of prior to this lovely pandemic. Like, what would you do if the caregivers can't come in? What do you do if you're sick and the caregivers can't come in because you're sick? Well, how do you guys handle stuff like that since you do in-home care? Yeah, so so that that's actually a question that we try to address um, every single time we have an introductory meeting or an exploratory meeting with a prospective client, um, it is, it is um, what happens when you have what we call as a, a call out um, or even worse, a no call, no show. And so, you know, in those circumstances, it's really, it really um, is about the relationship the agency has with the caregivers. And, um, you know, the problem that you have, at least in Massachusetts, is that there's very little regulation with private home care. Um, anybody with a couple thousand bucks can make a website, make some brochures, hire a couple people, and all of a sudden they're a private agency. And so, you know, one of the issues is that these caregivers are treated as, as, as kind of a commodity, their bodies rather than individuals. And what I mean by that is when you look at, there are some agencies that look at caregivers as that they're all the same. Um, and that's a problem because they aren't all the same. You have your A's, your B's, your C's and D's, just like any industry with any employers and, and employees. 
And so to answer your question, what that really comes down to is you need to have that good relationship with caregivers to say, hey, if you're in a jam, if you have an emergency, just call us. You're not going to get screamed at. You're not going to get um, hours taken away or anything like that. You, we, we'd rather know up front that there's a problem and we can address it than find out an hour into when you were supposed to be to your shift that you're not there. And so at the end of the day, what we do is it's, it's, it's um, an area where I think there's a problem with private home care is that they don't see the forest through the trees. And what I say to people is come hell or high water, we're going to get somebody to go out to that, to, to your case. Now there's always different circumstances where maybe it's a situation where, where it's companionship and it's not absolutely needed and we can make a switch to the next day and, and it's no big deal. But in the circumstances where we are absolutely needed there, um, that's where you or have to be willing to pay whatever it costs to get a caregiver to go out there and into an emergency to provide that safety net. And the, the other thing that we've done is we our home health aid supervisor is a caregiver. So she, her job is to be a bit of a jack of all trades where she can help out with scheduling, she can help out with office admin, but she can also go out and, and drop off supplies. And of course, she can be the emergency backup if we need somebody to go out there. So if we have a case that starts at 8 a.m. and we get the call at 7.30, we'll sound, send out our home health aid supervisor to cover for the two or three or four hours or however long it takes to find a replacement for somebody to go out there for a permanent um, replacement for that shift so that the family members know that mom isn't just sitting there for three hours or two hours alone until we find somebody. So that's really in my view, it's one of those, those it's, a, it's a trust thing. And when people um, call up, and it happens a lot more often than, than I realized when I got into this industry, hey, sorry, Jennifer, nobody's showing up for your shift today. We'll be there tomorrow. You know, this is now your problem. Figure it out. That breaks down trust with your, 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 your client who's paying your bills and is your customer. And it, it ruins trust with your employees. And it's just, it's just a bad way of doing business. And so I've always felt that that has to be avoided at all costs. So if I have to pay somebody $50 an hour to go out and cover a shift, I've got to pay somebody $50 an hour to go out and cover the shift. It's a non-negotiable um, scenario. Somebody has to go out there one way or another. So have you had any caregivers that have had to isolate because they've been um, exposed or they've had a family member exposed? Yep, absolutely we have. And, and so what we've done in those scenarios is, is again, it's, it's kind of right now is where you see the good agencies from the bad agencies and we've paid those caregivers to self-isolate and say, hey, listen, we're not going to let you lose out on money just because you've got this, this disease or you think you might have gotten this disease, but, um, but you're going into a scenario where um, it's a high risk, like an assisted living or something like that. Um, what we've done as much as possible and what we've done completely is that if you're working into assisted living, you're only working at that job. You're not working at other jobs where they, they work in an assisted living, then they go to somebody's home. We've limited those jobs. And then the other thing that we've done is we've limited the amount of caregivers that are working on a case. So what, one of the issues that people are finding is that, hey, if you go to a nursing home, your mom's in a nursing home and an assisted living, and you're thinking of pulling them back home, but you're still going to need care. Well, what we've been doing is we've been just having the caregiver go into overtime and working that into the cost and the wages and being able to provide a caregiver well, you know, for 50 or 60 hours out of the week rather than only 40 hours out of the week. And then that way it's limiting the amount of different people that are going into a home. And so that way then the caregivers are happy because one, they're not going to different locations. They have one steady job at one place. And then the families are happy because they have one caregiver that's coming in and they're not going to a bunch of different facilities and different homes. One of the reasons why I think that this crisis has turned into a crisis in the Boston area and in other areas is that hospitals, nursing homes, assisted livings, uh, VNAs, hospices, and private agencies are all pulling from the same pool of employment and, and, and caregivers. And those caregivers can be working at two or three different jobs at one time to get 80 hours a week. And so since we um, 
are, we can go into overtime, but care, but clients aren't going to pay overtime prices. We can only have caregivers working up to 40 hours a week, and then we can't employ them anymore. Then they go to another agency or a VNA or an assisted living, and then they work there. So you have these caregivers that are working at different locations at different times. What we've seen in the Boston area recently is that caregivers are just leaving the workforce totally. Uh, most agencies I've spoken with and a lot of assisted livings and nursing homes are, are seeing massive reductions in their staff, 20 to 40%. So if you're in a nursing home or you're in a assisted living and you're, you have a ratio, you know, they have ratios that they hit. So if they're at hundred percent occupancy, they need X amount of caregivers. If they go down to 80%, they need X minus that 20%. So they're still at the same ratios, or they were before all these deaths were occurring, and they were still only able to be staffed at 70% or whatever that number was. So there was a big issue, there's still a big issue of these caregivers that are going into these, these homes, or excuse me, into these facilities or communities, and they're overworked, and they're burned out, and they're, they're doing God's work. They're, they're the ones that are doing the hardest work there is, but they're, there's only so much they can do before they're going to crack. And that's the issue that we're, we're having where I don't blame caregivers for sitting on the sideline, but it's showing the issue we have. We already had an issue with caregiver shortages. Now we have a, a crisis of a magnitude that, that nobody has an answer for right now, and it's a, it's a big problem. So that kind of, uh, hopefully that answers a lot of the questions and a lot of the difficulties that we're seeing. Well, it gives me the, the question popped into my head. If you like the sit, so we ended up having in-home care for my parents when my dad was on hospice. So this was a little over three years ago. And of course I had to, I had to literally hire a home agency within 24 hours because the hospital was like, we're done with him. Come get him. I'm like, Oh hell no. <laughs> we're not ready over here. Cause you told me he wasn't coming out. Now you're telling me he's coming out. I hate the hospital system. So fortunately I interviewed three and I, I've got very lucky cause I went with gut instinct again, which is how I picked my mom's memory care community. <laughs> I was very blessed. I guess I have a good gut because I had, didn't have really any issues with the, home care agency. There was one gal, my dad was diabetic and he had his donated kidney was failing. And so he got the, the, is it the lymphedema? I mean, his legs were really swollen and then this is going to be gross, but basically it just, the fluid leaks out of the legs. So I'm hoping guys you aren't eating. One gal refused to deal with it. So I'm like, okay, don't come back. <laughs> Fortunately, I didn't have to tell her. I just told the manager. I'm like, if she can't deal with it, then she don't need to come back. And then there was one gal that did the overnight shift. I'm not really sure what she did. It should have been really easy because my parents were asleep. You know, and they slept pretty well. And they just, she just had to make sure my dad didn't fall because he was on. I had somewhat combative parents both times. He, he didn't think he needed help. He didn't want these ladies helping him, which I understand. And so it, it was a fairly simple job except for his attitude was kind of crappy so she was about to get the boot and then he passed away and then mom went in the memory care <laughs> it was just like it was just insane but the some of the things that i wish i had known were you know like what you're telling me you know like was there some other options that maybe wouldn't have required three different caregivers every day and we had the same caregivers on the same days so that, you know, it, it wasn't like we had just random people all the time. But what should somebody consider if they've got an elderly parent or you've got a spouse that's got a chronic illness and you may end up needing in-home care? Because I don't know how, I, I say this a lot, 70% of us are going to need care before we die. So, <laughs> so it's not a good thing for people who are going to need care in the near future. And hopefully this problem, this crisis of, availability of caregivers improves as you and I get older, but what should people consider so that they're not making decisions in a panic like I had to do? Because trust me, you don't want to have to rely on your gut. That's not always a great feeling. 
I mean, that's the whole reason I made my podcast, right? I mean, I was, I was going to Council on Aging to try to inform people on developing a plan and very few people were showing up. And I think that this medium that we're doing allows, as I said in, in the pre kind of uh, call we did a couple of days ago, you can bring the horse to water, you can't make them drink. Um, one of the things that I've always thought is important, I think I recommend it, is, is kind of the five wishes program. Um, I've always thought that that's a good recommendation and it's basically, um, it goes through five questions on what you want to happen as, as, as you start to decline. Um, it, it's a bit more around actual like kind of passing away, but at least it starts that process of a- answering the questions. And then, you know, the, the, your, your example and your experience is, is, is very typical, unfortunately, where people somehow there's some miscommunication with a hospital or maybe the hospital doesn't communicate and they find out usually on a Friday around three o'clock, nothing good ever happens in, in healthcare. You find out there's a discharge going on and you need services immediately. And, and listen, we don't like it any more than you do because the more time we have to prepare, the better we can find a match for you and we're not rushing to find somebody immediately. Um, so I think the, 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 the first step is having the conversation with mom or dad and what you want to happen when this decline occurs. Because, you know, sometimes families really push their parents into something that they may not, they may not want. And, and there's a saying in our industries that, that everybody has the right to fail. And if somebody doesn't want something, they have that right to say no, even if it might be detrimental to their, their long-term outcome. And it's not a fun thing to say, but it's still a choice that they get to make. And so obviously that becomes much more difficult when you're dealing with memory issues. But if somebody's still sharp and their body's failing them and not their mind, they have, in my opinion at least, that right to make that decision on what they want to do. And if that ends up being a broken hip and leads to an infection and then it leads to their untimely death, as horrible as that is to say, it's their choice. So having that conversation with mom or dad is really important. I've had that with my dad. I didn't need to have that with my mom because she got cancer suddenly and passed away within three or four months. Um, but you know, with, with my dad, we've had that conversation on what you want to happen in these certain scenarios. And, and that's important. The other thing you got to look at are the finances. What is available to somebody to be able to, to provide that? If you don't have money, I'm not going to be able to help you out because we do private home care. Assisted livings aren't going to work for you because they get paid privately as well. And so um, are you going to need to sign up for Medicaid? Are you going to need to have that seven year look back period or is it a five year look back period on Medicaid? If you're going to go into the long-term side of nursing homes, or are you going to try to do this on your own? Um, so there's a, there's a lot of options and I see it every day where people get the fire hose of information. I call it, it's just like walking into a, 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 a literally the fire hoses that they put out buildings with. And it's like, well, we're going to give you about a, a four year degree in, in Medicare and CMS and every senior care in about 30 seconds, figure it out. And it's, 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 and, and I try to be fair. It, there's definitely some fault to the system is certainly broken in areas, but there's also the fault of family members as well, where nobody wants to talk about these really difficult conversations a lot either because, but we all jokingly say to each other, death and taxes, it's death and taxes guaranteed in life, but nobody wants, like you, you said, hey, we're, 70% of us are going to need care, but somehow everybody internalizes, well, I'm going to be the 30% that doesn't, so I don't need to talk about it. And it's a difficult conversation to have without a doubt. Well, it's a conversation my dad pretty much skipped. So this was about four years ago this month. I decided to try flying all over the handlebars of my bicycle and see what slamming into the pavement was like. That wasn't cool. And so I had my first broken, my only broken bone at 49 and a half. So I was dealing with that. I had to have surgery to fix it. And he's talking about, well, I got to get my garage cleaned out because, you know, I got to prepare for the end. Well, you know, I was kind of dealing with my own thing, but I was listening to him and, but I didn't listen between the lines because what he was not saying was my donated kidney is failing and we all knew he did not want to go back on dialysis. And I was, I totally understood that. What he didn't say was, I'm probably going to need some help. He just assumed he'd die within a t- 
two week period. And then I don't know what the hell he thought would happen because my mom would have thought he was asleep. So that would have been pretty ugly. His friend would have probably come over and found him or the neighbor or, you know, one of us daughters. I just, I still get angry with him when I think about that. Cause it's like, dude, like really, <laughs> what did you think was going to happen if you died within two weeks? And he didn't, he came home from hospice on January 12th and he died March 2nd. So it took two months. It's like crazy. So yeah, nobody likes to have that conversation. I have had the conversation with my family. There's only the three of us. So, you know, there's not, there's not a lot of backup, you know, like there's my daughter, she could help her dad if I needed care. But I've basically said, you know, well, I've actually said when I get to a certain point where I cannot assist in my own care, it's time for the permanent night night pill, which I know is not legal. Hopefully, maybe someday you can, I, as a in my right mind kind of person, I could go and do a trust and all of the legal documents and also attach to it like whatever you'd need from a doctor, psychologist that says, yes, this person is sane and their brain is fine. They can make this decision because, oh, you know, my mom lived for, with Alzheimer's for 20 years and she, I think she only is gone now because she broke her leg. And her body was like, oh, pfft. <laughs> I'm done with this crap. <laughs> she did pick a really good time to go, though, because I can't imagine not being able to go and see her still after, what has it been, almost three months? Yeah. Well, I mean, a couple points is, one, most people don't realize that they think, I'm guessing maybe your dad thought this as well, oh, these two weeks, I'll go on hospice, they'll take care of everything, and then I'm done. And even if that wasn't the case with your dad, most people think that hospice, once you're on hospice, everything's taken care of. And that couldn't be further from the truth on what um, services you get. And, you know, as uh, the entitlements if, and, and, and CMS gets more and more stressed with money, they keep cutting back on those services that they're willing to reimburse for. Um, so you don't get all these services with, with hospice as you think. And we get a lot of referrals from hospice companies that say, Hey, this family didn't, didn't realize that they don't get all this, this care. They thought so. <laughs> they don't um, have 24, 24 hour hospice care. Yeah. And, and to your point, I completely agree. We treat our animals, our dogs and our cats with more um, dignity and death than we do our own, our own um, uh, family and our own neighbor. Um, I can't tell you how many, how, and I think I, I think I get this a little bit more because I'm in private home care. And by the time they get to hospice, they feel guilty about this feeling because they nobody realizes that there's a, a rainbow of emotions when you're dealing with the, the, the loss of your family members. But there are a lot of people that, that just say they, you know, they in frustration, I wish mom would just die. And they don't mean that they want some horrible death, but they know that mom has been gone for a pretty long period of time. And, and the quote I heard from somebody that was, was, was heart wrenching was mom died years ago. I've been taking care of the body. And, and so some, some uh, dementia experts may vehemently disagree with that, that mom might be in there somewhere. But the conversations that we have with our parents, and I think you and I sound like we're in the same boat, where once I am a burden on my family and I am causing more pain than I am providing more happiness, give me the night-night pills. Like, let's get this, the, you know, my mom was the same way with cancer. Like, get me the hell out of here. This cancer is in my bones. It is breaking my bones internally. Let's end this. And you couldn't end it because it wasn't legally allowed. And I know that I have family members without naming names that have a secret stash of pills they've been collecting for the last 10 years because they say, hey, listen, I'm keeping all those Vicodins and Percocets and Oxycodones for when I get that diagnosis and it becomes unbearable and let's just pull the plug and get this over with because you know you're not you're 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 not going to get treated as humanely as you do with bringing your dog to a vet petting them and saying goodbye and then they fall asleep and it's over with and it's a lot more i saw it with my mom and i saw her last i i saw my mom's last image in my brain and it wasn't a pretty one and it would have been much more dignified to be able to inject her with whatever she falls asleep, a sleeping agent, and then a, and then a lack of a better term, death agent, whatever it is. And then it's over with. And 
that's something that should be, if we have a, a right to life, we should have a right to a dignified death. And that would certainly negatively impact my business <laughs> uh, because I care for people with dementia. You know, we were talking about assisted livings. I look at assisted livings as you have the dementia unit and then you have the people that just won't admit that they're in the dementia unit, which is the traditional unit because there's so much memory issues in the traditional unit as well. Not everybody, but you know, there are a lot of people that we provided care for that refused to go downstairs where the crazy people were. And mom and dad were like, but you have dementia too, but they weren't willing to admit it and they needed 24 hour care. And that's how we, we, you know, had services that way. Um, so, I mean, to your, to your point, I, I completely agree in it, in it and there need to be some changes around that. And it's, it's, it's very difficult because, you know, when we look at this COVID COVID-19, you know, the, it's it's becoming more and more clear that a lot of people that are becoming uh, that are susceptible to this and have died from this are people that are have comorbidities co comorbidities that a lot of them have dementia where they're walking around touching feeling touching their face you know you know what it's like they're down you can't lock them in their room it's illegal in Massachusetts to do that even though in this scenario it would be the best thing for them because then they wouldn't be mingling with other people but since you can't do that and that's not allowed then you know they interacted and then in my from what I understand it gets in through people coming in and out of the building and then it it hit the dementia unit first because everybody's wandering and walking around and then staffing didn't know that they were asymptomatic and they went from the nurse the dementia unit and they went into traditional and, and then it spread and then once it's in there it's becoming really difficult to get it out and it's super scary once it's in there, even after you think, all right, we've had a week and things are getting better, boom, two more people get COVID. And then you're like, we're back in it again. So it's it's not easy whatsoever. Yeah, and they keep saying that it's, that it may never go away completely, even with a vaccine, which that's a thrilling thought. Thanks, thanks medical or science, science people. <laughs> it creeps me out. But I laughed because, well, to back up one step, my grand, my maternal grandfather also died from bone cancer, so I know how horrible that is. And at one point, my mom said, this was in, he died in 99. My mom said, you know, he's in pain. Can we give him more morphine? And they said, no, they were afraid he'd get addicted. Like, just process that one. And I think my mom severely considered overdosing him. I'm, I don't know if she, I, I suspect, because I, she and I are, think a lot alike my I was more like my dad but I think she probably thought about it a lot because he was I mean my uncle gave him just a gentle shoulder hug and cracked a bone because they're so brittle which obviously you understand but then you were talking about people with dementia my mom would pick up crap off the floor and the, uh, we'd go I'd take her places prior to most well up until the end of 99 or 99, <laughs> 2019, having a flashback here. I would take her out. We'd go to the park. We'd watch kids in the, you know, I'm in Northern California, so we don't get weather like you do, but you know, we, it does get cold and windy and foggy and blech. So we'd go to the library or I would take her to the fabric store or to, you know, like Pete's or Starbucks or something. And I swear, if there was something on the floor, she'd bend over and pick it up and ask me, is this yours? And there were times it's like, please don't pick that. I don't know what that is, where it's been. No, nope, please don't hand it to me. Oh, yuck. You know, and then you have to go get a clerk to unlock the bathroom. And then you got to talk them into washing their hands. It's like, I don't need this crap. <laughs> so the very, the, let's see. I'm trying to remember. We mostly stayed in the community. January, February of 2020, which looking back, I mean, obviously it was probably safer, but you know, sometimes I kind of feel a little guilty that we didn't go and do fun things, but she was getting really challenging and I didn't want her to be combative and become a problem in a public place. So that was, that was the end with her, but oh yeah, she would pick stuff up off the floor and it's like, tissues and trash and was like i was always afraid of what she'd hand me <laughs> yeah and for 
Oh, Go and ahead. for people that don't know, I mean, there, there, there are people that like a dementia unit usually, or the modern ones, are in some type of circular or square design that allows people to just endlessly wander. And and not everybody, but people will sit there and they will touch every single. Fading Memories is also available wherever you get your favorite podcasts.